Hello everyone, this is Ma'am Amano and this lecture video is all about mineralogy. So mineralogy is a field of science that deals with the study of minerals, meaning to say we will be discussing all about minerals on this lecture video. We can define a mineral as an element or compound that occurs naturally in rocks and soil. So what are the five characteristics that a certain thing must meet in order to be classified as mineral? So first, all minerals are solids. So, for example, they must be solid in all conditions. For example, you have ice. Can it be a mineral? Pwede ba maging mineral yung ice? Solid yun, di ba? But then, uh, it is not stable. The phase of the ice is not stable in all conditions. Meaning to say, at room temperature, it can be uh, converted into liquid. So, therefore, it can't be a mineral. So, it must be solid in all conditions. The second characteristic is that minerals form naturally or they are naturally occurring here on earth. So, minerals that are synthetically uh, made in the laboratory is not a mineral. Then third, minerals are inorganic, meaning to say the substances that make up the minerals were never part of the living things, nor were they formed by living things. So, ibig sabihin hindi nang galing sa living things. What are the living things? Plants, animals, humans. For example, dried twigs. Can they be a mineral? No, because they are from plants, which is a living thing. How about coal? They can't be a mineral because they are from fossils, which are from living things that existed millions of years ago. So again, minerals must be inorganic or not from living things. Fourth characteristic is that they must have a definite chemical composition. For example, the pyrite. What do we mean by chemical composition? Chemical formula. Dapat pare-pares yung chemical formula nila. Hindi nagbabago in all conditions. Kaya nga dapat solid sila in all conditions para hindi magbabago yung chemical composition nila. For example, the pyrite. The chemical formula of pyrite is one iron and then two sulfur. So, mean to say all pyrite must have one atom of iron and two pieces of sulfur for it to be classified as pyrite or mineral. Another example, uh, let us have olivine. Olivine is a type of mineral having iron and then 2 and then SiO4. Meaning to say it contains 2 iron, 1 silicon, and 4 oxygen. So all olivine must contain this chemical formula that must be definite. Di nagbabago in all conditions. And then the fifth characteristic is that atoms of minerals must have an orderly atomic arrangement which can be denoted with the presence of a crystal. So crystal of a mineral is the outward sign of this orderly atomic uh, arrangement, meaning to say they must have a definite chemical structure in terms of their crystals. So for example, the pyrite earlier, it has one iron and then two sulfur. So it must have that arrangement. Now let us proceed on groups of minerals. First, we have here the silicates. Silicates are minerals containing silicon and oxygen. And then two classifications of silicates are ferromagnesian and non-ferromagnesian. Ferromagnesians are silicates containing significant amount of iron and magnesium in addition to silicon and oxygen. And then the non-ferromagnesian, these are silicates that contain little or no iron and magnesium at all. They only have the silicon and oxygen. So, for example, for ferromagnesian, we have here the olivines, pyroxenes, augite, amphiboles, hornblende, garnet, and biotite. So, you can determine their chemical composition by looking up on their chemical formula. Next, we have here the non-ferromagnesian. They contain little or no iron and magnesium at all. So, examples are feldspars, quartz, muscovite, and clays. The most abundant silicate is the feldspar, and then the most common is the quartz. They are uh, very common and can be easily found among volcanoes. Another group of silicates are the oxides. They form when an element combines with oxygen. Examples are corundum, hematite, and magnetite. Then we have here the sulfides. These are compounds containing the elements sulfur. Examples are galena, chalcoprite, and pyrite. Then halides. These are group of minerals have uh, formed when elements combine with chlorine, iodine, bromine, or fluorine. Examples are halite and fluorite. Then carbonates, these are a group of minerals or compounds containing a carbon atom surrounded by three oxygen atoms. Examples are azurite, aragonite, and malachite. Then last, we have here the sulfates. These are minerals or compounds containing a sulfur atom surrounded by four oxygen atoms. Examples are gypsum and barite. Then let us proceed on the basic test to identify minerals. First, we have here the crystal shape. In identifying a mineral. So, if a mineral sample is a well developed crystal, its crystal shape is an important clue to its identity. So, for example, I have here uh, all crystals are flat shaped here. So, whatever their appearance is, they are flat shaped on this part, which under microscope, this is their structure in a mineral. 
Okay, they all have a crystal shape or they have, in, if the crystals are too small, they can be seen under a microscope. So, there must be a presence of crystal shape indicating an orderly atomic arrangement. Second is the hardness. Uh, the minerals gold and pyrite are similar in color and one can easily be mistaken for the other. So, the pyrite is sometimes called the fool's gold because it resembles the gold. But then, one simple test, however, can easily distinguish the two minerals. Pyrite is much harder than gold. So, you can use a scale to test the hardness of any minerals. So, I have here the most hardness scale in which it was developed by Austrian mineralogist Friedrich Moe in 1822. So, the, the softest mineral is the talc and gypsum, then calcite. Here, you can scratch this using a fingernail at 2.5 here. Or it crumbles on its own. And then the second softest one is the gypsum, third calcite, fluorite, apatite, orthoclase, quartz, topaz, corundum, and then the hardest is the diamond. So here, until the 3.5 for the copper penny, the calcite here, you can scratch it using a copper penny. And then the fluorite and apatite, up to 5.5 of that, you can scratch that using a knife or glass plate. And then the orthoclase and quartz, you can scratch that up with, using a steel nail. And then for topaz, for quartz until the 8.5 of topaz, you can uh, scratch that or drill using a masonry drill bit. Okay? But then the diamond, the diamond itself, it can only be cut or scratched using another diamond. So it's only a diamond to diamond. Okay? Another way to identify a mineral is the presence of their color. So, a few minerals can be identified by color. Uh, sulfur, for example, is bright yellow. I have here the picture of that. Sulfur is bright yellow, azurite is blue, and malachite is green. But the color of most minerals varies. So, sometimes they have uh, multiple colors in a single uh, ball of minerals. So, how do we identify their color? So, we are using the strict method. This is strict is a more reliable test than color. So, how do we use this method? I have here this picture. So, streak is the color of a mineral in its powdered form. Streak is obtained by rubbing a mineral across a streak plate, a piece of unglazed porcelain. This is your unglazed porcelain here. While the color of a mineral may vary from sample to sample, the streak usually doesn't vary. So, therefore, streak can be a good indicator to differentiate between mineral groups. And then another test that can be done is the cleavage and fracture. So observing the way a mineral breaks can help you identify it. So you have to compare the two breaking pattern. I have here this picture. So if a mineral breaks along one or more smooth flat surface, therefore it has a cleavage. But then we also have here the fracture when a mineral breaks along an irregular surface. For example, so I have here the asbestos. It has a splintery or fibrous fracture or wiring or hair-like uh, fracture. And then this quartz here has a conchoidal fracture. It, it, it doesn't uh, break into flat, smooth surface. So if it doesn't break to flat surface, therefore the mineral contains a fracture and not a cleavage. For cleavage, it must be plain, smooth, and uh, breaks along uh, on its center edges. Then for magnetism, we also have the magnetism as another uh, way to identify a mineral. It means a few minerals that contain iron are magnetic. The most common magnetic mineral, this one, is magnetite, sometimes called the lodestone. Meaning to say it can attract another metal. And then another property to identify a mineral is the density and specific gravity. So each mineral has a unique density, which is the mineral's mass divided by its volume. Density is mass over volume, right? So where is the picture of that? Mm, this one. The higher a mineral's density, the more tightly packed are its atoms. So you can compare densities of some minerals by comparing their heft or how heavy the pieces of the same size feel. For example, the galena here feels much heavier than the same size of piece of talc. They have the same size. But the galena here, if you will touch this one, it is heavier compared to talc. So therefore, the galena has a higher density and specific gravity compared to the talc. Then another way to identify a mineral is by acid test. So earth scientists use an acid test to find out if a mineral is a carbonate mineral. Most carbonate gives off carbon dioxide gas. So the, most of the time they are using a diluted hydrochloric acid or muriatic acid that are placed on the sample. They put it the sample and then they can, they can identify if that is a carbonate if it gives off a carbon dioxide gas. So usually it fizzes or bubbles up and that is an indicator of the presence of carbon dioxide. There is a chemical change, so that is an acid test. 
Then I have here another topic, the precious gems. These are rare or uh, hard to obtain minerals can be used as a jewelry with a specific value. Examples are diamonds, chrysolite, euclid, ruby, sapphire, tafelt, emerald, heliodor, and alexandrite. Now let us proceed on the common uses of minerals. I have here for copper, it can be used as electric wire, plumbing, coins, then diamond, jewelry, cutting tools, and drill bits. For galen, it can be used in batteries, ammunition, website, cans, foil, appliances, utensils. For gold, jewelry, computers, spacecraft, and dentistry. Gypsum, wall boards, plaster, and cement. Highlight can be used in the nutrition, highway, the icer, and water softener. For quartz, it can be used in glasses, computer chips. For silver, it can be used in jewelry, photography, electronic products. Then sphalerite, it can be used in jet aircraft, spacecraft, and paints. Another one we have here, the halite, which can be used as a table salt and food preservation when extracted. And then graphite in pencil and lubricant in tennis racket. And then fluorite, it can be used in toothpaste and drinking water. Kernite, it can be used in the borax or soap. And then gold, it can be used as fillings for teeth, jewelry, electronics, and computers. For galena, it can be used as uh, lead or for batteries for, uh, let us say, computers. And then quartz, it can be used in glasses, computer chips, paint, laundry detergent, watches, non-stick cooking surfaces. And then talc, it can be used in the powder, ceramics, paint paper, plastics, and cosmetics. And then the emery or the corundum, it can be used in nail files. And then the cyanobar, it can be used as a mercury ore. So when we talk about, let us say, ore, we define this as a mineral or growth minerals from which a useful material can be extracted at a profit. It is called an ore. So for example, the hematite is an ore of iron or iron ore where you can extract iron. Okay, so this iron can be used in the industries in such as uh, architecture or computers. Okay, so meaning to say these are the sources. Now let us talk about the mineral resources or where they are usually obtained. So minerals can be obtained or formed in the magma. Okay, when the volcano exploded, there will be a magma and then uh, it it will become a lava and it will be solidified. So those contains crystals and mostly they contain the quartz. Okay, there are times that they are being carried away in the stream or in the river. So the process to obtain those mineral in terms of mining aside from digging is the, uh, for example, I have here the mineral of the dom dolomite in Cebu. They mine the dolomite mineral. Okay, right? They place that in the bay walk, in the Manila Bay, and they flatten the mountain. But there are times that minerals are being washed uh, in the streams, in the river, dinadala ng uh, ulan, so naipon yun sa rivers. Kaya may mga area na kapag, lalo na kapag malapit sa bundok, for example yung Mayon Volcano. So yung mas bate isa yun sa mga pinaka-active na mining site or gold panning site ng ating mineral na gold. Why? Because most of the pieces of golds are being carried away through rivers and streams when it rains. So yung mga ilog doon ay my, my tint ng yellow, which is an indicator of the presence of gold in powdered form. So, ginagawa nila nagpapaning sila. And then, let's talk about the mining in the Philippines. The Philippines is ranked globally as the third largest gold producer. Imagine third. Fourth for copper and fifth for nickel. Among the Southeast Asian countries, the Philippines have the greatest number of proven deposits of metallic and non-metallic minerals. And then, the Philippines has been ranked as the fifth most mineralized country in the world uh, and in legal terms, with an estimated uh, $1 trillion in untapped reserves of copper, gold, nickel, zinc, and silver. So, marami to sa Zamboanga, mas bati Surigao. And then, the Philippines' top mineral exports are copper, gold, and nickel. Other target minerals include quartz, mica, iron, gypsum, filled spark, chromite, calcite, and sulfur. Some target non-metallic minerals are sand and gravel, limestone, marble, clay, and other quarry materials. When I say quarry, these are rocks na dinidig. Tapos, kukunin nila yung uh, pinaka... Uh, or non, para gamitin mostly sa construction. Cobalt is the main factor for the increased interest in the minerals used in battery technology in the Philippines kasi mas cheaper ang workforce sa Pilipinas. The Philippines is the fourth largest cobalt reserves worldwide, an estimated 280,000 tons. The following regions have high metallic and gold mining activities. This are Binguet, Masbaten, Nueva Vizcaya, Cebu, Compostela Valley, Davao, Palawan, and Surigao. So, mostly yung water beds natin, lalo na yung sa bedrock sa oceanic part ng ating Palawan uh, area, marami pa dong untapped copper, gold, and silver deposits. Okay? So, what are the laws governing our mining industry in the Philippines? We have here the RA 7942, the Philippine Mining Act of 1995. 
in the protection of mining. These are the contents. And then Executive Order 79, daw 1996-40, which hindi pa na, ano, hindi pa na re-revise or na-update since 2012. So, that is all for mineralogy.